So, as you can see on the board, my, my topic this morning is the illusion and the substance. One of the real challenges that we face, we human beings, in the world that we live is that, you know, the Bible says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Many times in the world today, you don't know what is real and what is a lie. If you listen to, for example, one of the current topics, you listen to um, the, the, the American candidates for the presidency, you listen to, to Donald Trump, and you listen to Hillary Clinton, and depending on who, who you are listening to, everybody is saying, every side is saying that the other side is a liar. And nobody knows who is telling the truth, and the truth is that probably both of them are not telling the truth. But it's the nature of the world, right? You, you, you get into the realm of health, and... and the, 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 the health community, the health information is full of lies and deception. You don't know what to believe. A few years ago, they told you that coconut oil was dangerous for your health. Everybody stopped using it. And now we, we are hearing that coconut oil is the best thing that could possibly be, 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 be used. For, and it's now the most expensive. It, it, it's, it can be used for almost everything. Some time ago, you heard that the best thing was Soya beans, now they say soya is very, is very harmful. It's not so good for you. I don't, you don't know what to believe. So, I'm saying that we really live in an illusion. You know what an illusion is, right? It's, it's like a mirage, something that appears to be real, but it isn't really. And, and perhaps the area in which we have the greatest illusion is the area of religion. And it's the area where we have to be most certain that we have the truth. I want to suggest to you that even among, even among us here, even among people of our persuasion, we sometimes get caught in the illusion. This morning in our Sabbath school, we were, we were talking about how to experience this life of the second Adam. How do we receive what is already ours? Well, I think... Our, our experience demonstrates that maybe we don't fully have the answer or experience the answer. Because if you know the answer, why don't you have the experience? And sometimes I feel that, you know, we're all a little bit to blame. Because, you know, Paul says, knowledge does what? Puffs up. It makes people proud. Knowledge puffs up. And I think he means knowledge that does not enter the experience. It makes people proud, but it is, it is experience, it is charity that edify it. So I want to talk about illusion and the substance this morning. I want to start with a, with a question that I'm sure we are all very familiar with the answer. But I'm going, to, I'm going to ask the question, I'm going to just go through it again, remind us of it before I get to the meat of what I want to say this morning. What is the new covenant? I want to read from Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34 which is the first place in the Bible where it actually mentions a new covenant. I believe it's the first place. Here's what God says. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That is what God himself promises in Jeremiah. Now God says, there is coming a time when he is going to put his law in the hearts of his people. And he says, everybody who is called God's child will know God personally. Nobody will have to teach you saying, know the Lord, because you are going to know him personally. I would to God that all of us had, had experienced at least this part, this aspect of the new covenant. Because sometimes it's clear that we have not experienced what it means to know God. I would say we know about God. But not many people really know God. Sometimes even those of us who know God, we step back a little bit from that experience. And it shows. It always shows when you're not 
in the right relationship with God. It always shows. So, according to this passage, the new covenant is God's law in the heart. If you look at the picture, where was it originally? On two tables of stone. It was outside of you. It said, do this, and you try to do it. But if it's in your heart, whatever is in your heart, it happens naturally, right? If something is in your heart, nobody has to tell you to do it. It's what you want to do. If it's in your heart to, to watch a certain kind of movie, love stories or action movies, nobody has to encourage you. Your heart draws you. If you love somebody, your heart pulls you in that direction. So when God says, I will put my law in your heart, he's talking about something that happens on the inside. You can tell that people have not experienced a new covenant when they don't really want to do the way of God. You have to keep reminding them. You have to keep talking to them. You have to keep counseling them. You have to keep quarreling with them to try to get them to do what God wants. It doesn't work. But you keep trying to do it and you can tell that they, they have not really experienced this new covenant. When, when God has put his law in your heart, it is your joy to do what it says. Something changes. And that's not hard to understand because you can understand that different, kind of, different kinds of creatures, they like different things. One of the greatest joys for a dog is to run and chase cars, right? You, you, you probably would never find a, 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 a goat doing that. right? What makes him happy is to sit down and eat grass all day. And even we as people, we have different likes and dislikes. Some people like to sit down and read. Some people like to draw a picture. Some people like to cook. Different things. But when somebody loves something, you don't have to tell the person to do it. It's their delight. They feel unhappy if they're not doing it. God says a time was coming when all who are truly his people, nobody would have to tell them to do what he wants because it would flow out of them naturally and happily. They would love to do what he wants. It's painful to know that it's not the experience of many who say they are Christians. Here's another statement about the new covenant. This is Jesus' own statement. And hear what he says. In Luke 22, verses 19 to 20, he says, it says, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new testament or the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Now later today we're going to have the communion and we're going to be doing exactly what Jesus said we should do. But Jesus said the New Testament is what? It's my blood which is shed for you. So first of all, the New, the new Testament is God's law in the heart. But now Jesus says it's my blood. What does that mean? Well, we go to the Old Testament, Leviticus 17 and verse 11, and it tells us what that means. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. So we understand that when the Bible talks about blood, it's talking about what? Life. life. So the new covenant is the law of God in the heart. But it is also the life of Jesus Christ. That is the new covenant. Now, it says the blood has been shed for us. If you look at the picture of the lamb, they always, the blood was always poured out. But they also caught some in a basin. Now, we can say then that the new covenant is also the life of Jesus. But there's an important thing that we need to remember. I don't want you to bypass this. And it's in this next verse. John 6 and verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What did we say the blood is? So Jesus is saying, if you don't eat my flesh and drink of my life. If you don't, it's not just that Jesus' life was poured out for you 2,000 years ago at Calvary. What else is true? Jesus' life is available to you today and you have to partake of that life. Otherwise, you have no life in you, right? Yeah. It's what we were trying to say in Sabbath school this morning. Legally, 
everybody has been saved. But experientially, not everybody drinks the blood. Not everybody eats the flesh. If you don't eat his flesh and drink his blood, he died for you. Yes, but you can't experience it unless you, you are partaking of that life. What we are about to do today in our communion service, it may be a symbol, but it's a symbol of a real experience. We are supposed to be taking in Jesus continually. And today I want, to, I want to talk a little bit more about how do we do that. Because that how is one of the most important things. So it is the life of Jesus. Not just the life that was shed for me. But the life of Jesus living in me. That's a new covenant. So it's the law of God inside. It's the life of Jesus poured out for me. And the life of Jesus living in me. Do you have this experience? Is what I want to ask. Then there's a third statement I want to read from 2 Corinthians 3, 5 to 6. We all are familiar with it again. But let's read it. It says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency is of God. Who also has made us able ministers of what? Of the New Testament. And he explains what he's talking about. He's saying... Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Now it's clear when we read that passage that when he says the letter and the spirit, when he says the letter, he's talking about what? He's talking about the Ten Commandments because he says it was, it was written and engraved on stones. I think it says that in verse 7. The ministration of death written and engraven in stones. Now, our illustration here. You can see the Ten Commandments and you can see the rest of the laws and it has a picture of them nailed to the cross. But it doesn't matter which of these we are talking, whether those, the ceremonies or the moral law, the Ten Commandments. All of it has to do with the letter. It's what is written. The letter is what is written. And Paul says, God has made us ministers not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So when, when Jeremiah says, God says, I will write my law in your heart. Is he talking about the letter or the spirit? spirit? The spirit. So the law in your heart is not 10 commandments. It's not 613 commandments. It's the spirit of God put in your heart to bring about a change. So this, uh, let, let's go on. We had these verses this morning. We had this verse this morning. And so it is written. 1 Corinthians 15:45. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a what? And quickening means what? A life-giving spirit. So when Paul says we are ministers of the spirit, he means we are ministers of this life-giving spirit. And who is that life-giving spirit? It's Jesus Christ. So the new covenant has to do with the life of Christ. It has to do with the spirit of the law written in our hearts. It has to do with the life-giving spirit. That's the new covenant. And of course, here's a clincher. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17 says clearly, Now the Lord is that spirit. Do we need to be confused? The Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So... The life of Christ in you is the spirit of Christ in you. And the spirit of Christ in you is the, is the spirit of the law in you. Which is really Christ in you. So the new covenant in the word is Christ in you. And that's what the Lord tells us. It is the spirit of Jesus. In Isaiah 42 and verse 6. God says. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness. And I will hold thine hand. And I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. This prophecy is talking about Jesus. God says, I will give you as a covenant. So you might call it the law in the heart. You might call it the blood of Jesus or the life of Jesus. You might call it the spirit of God. But ultimately, the new covenant is Jesus Christ himself. So the new covenant has to do with Jesus and this is where people make a big mistake because they have been pursuing the illusion instead of the reality. It is Jesus himself. 
So it's the law within, it is the life of Jesus, it is the spirit of Jesus, but it is ultimately Jesus himself. Christ himself within is what makes the new covenant different from the old covenant. Apart from this, there's no difference between both covenants. Jesus is the difference. He's what was not there in old covenant times. The literal presence of Christ himself is everything. Notice those words. Literal. What does that mean? It's reality. It's not figurative, right? When you say Christ is present. If you judge things by your physical senses, you think it's figurative. You think he can't be here because I can't see him, I can't smell him, I can't taste him, I can't touch him. But that is, that is carnal thinking. Because you think that reality is defined by your five senses. If you think this way, you very much belong to this world. But there is a world just as real or even more real that exists outside of your five senses. And this is the true world that Christians belong to. The literal presence of Christ, very real, not discernible with the five senses, but just as real. That's what we are dealing with. And this is everything. If you don't have this, you have nothing. You could have the Ten Commandments. You could have the whole Bible. You have nothing. If you don't have that literal presence, you could call yourself a Christian a little more. You could baptize ten times. Without this literal presence, you have nothing. You are deceiving yourself and you are living in a dream world. No element in Christianity exists outside of that reality. And you can tell that we have the problem because look here. When money is short, you fret like everybody else. When hurricane threatens, you fret like everybody else. When sickness comes, you fret like everybody else. All the problems that are in the world are your problems just the same. And yet you say you're a Christian. You don't have the reality. You only have the, the illusion. Paul says, we read it already. God has made us ministers of the New Testament. And it says of the disciples, listen to what? Listen to how they understood that. Acts 5 and verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to what? Teach. Teach and preach Jesus Christ. When it says we are ministers of the New Testament, this is what it means. Teach and preach Jesus Christ. But don't believe that because you said Jesus. You are preaching Jesus Christ. Lots of people say Jesus Christ. And they talk about the many different things relating to Jesus. And yet they do not preach Christ. When we preach Christ, it has to include all those components that we mentioned already. Now, here are some illusions and misconceptions. I just want to emphasize this. Number one, first illusion, it is the belief that we are Christians if we know the teachings of Christ. Okay, I've read through the Bible a dozen times. You read through the New Testament how many times? You can memorize it and repeat the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 23. You think that makes you a Christian? That's the first illusion, to think that Knowing the teachings of Christ is Christianity. No! Not because we have Sabbath school and you go home and read the Bible. That does not make you a Christian. That's an illusion that many people are living in. Are you a Christian if you obey the teachings of Christ? I still say no. And I have the Bible to back me up. And that's the number, number one reason where people are deceived. They think that if they... The, the, the endeavor of their life is to obey Jesus. And they think by obeying him, it makes them a Christian. No, that's not what the Bible says. They think that it's, they are Christians if they can walk as Christ walked. Wrong. Now you're probably thinking by this time, come on. If it's not obeying Christ, and it's not walking as Christ walked, what is Christianity really? That's the million dollar question. And the reason why it's so puzzling to us is because we have not experienced it. We don't really know what it is. The very fact that this can be so puzzling is a statement that we don't know what it is. And I hope you are, you are at that place where you are thinking, what then is it? Because at least if you ask a question, you're open for the answer. Let's see if we can see where, where we're really going. Is Christianity the ways of Jesus... Or is it Jesus? Jesus? That answer is right. I hope the experience is right. 
The ways of Christ are not Christ. Jesus is the only, is the only Christ. Jesus himself is Christianity, not the ways of Christ. And the great illusion that I find is destroying people is that they are pursuing the ways of Christ. Not Jesus himself. I agree. Cindy is saying maybe the ways of Christ can help to lead people to Christ. And I agree because the Bible says that. The Bible says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But when the, when the way brings you to Christ and you still hold to the way, then you're in a problem. Because, you know, I needed my diapers at a certain stage. Hopefully, I got rid of them. Like they say when some people get old, they go back to them, but I'm not at that place. So, I got rid of them. Everything is good in its place. So the words and the ways of Christ, as Cindy says, can help you to find Christ. But having found him, you need to move on to the greater place. And that's the place where many, that, that's where many people are not moving on. John 6, 28 and 29. Jesus, you know, it's amazing how he said things, but sometimes he never emphasized them, but they are there as gems for all eternity. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that, that we might work the works of God? They wanted to do the things that Jesus did, didn't they? They wanted the ways of Christ, the works of Christ, the deeds of Christ. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. You don't need to worry about doing the ways of Christ. That's not your business. You don't need to worry about walking as Christ walked. That's not your business. Your business is to believe on Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We'll look at that in a moment. But that's the point. It's not doing the works of Christ. That's not Christianity. That's not the ways of God. That's not what God wants. A relationship with the ways of Christ rather than Christ himself leads to a life that is focused on doing. It's not focused on a person. It's focused on doing. Now I want to give you an illustration. Sean is married to Opal. Brother Bill is married to Sister, Sister Howard. I'm married to Sister Jen. Tony is married to Sister Jill. And many couples in here, right? I've said this to my wife many times. Sometimes I get fed up because she spends so much time on the housework. Is the middle name of most women, right? But I say, if I had wanted a helper, I would have hired one. Because a helper can do the work. But I, I, I got you because I needed a wife, not a helper. And I'm trying to say, it's my way of saying, pay some attention to me and let the work stay there sometimes, right? I'm sure the men can empathize. Now, the point I'm making really is that relationships are not primarily based upon performance. If your relationship with your wife is based upon how she performs, you're on shaky ground. Because the time will come when she cannot perform as well as she performs today. Maybe she doesn't do the work as well. Maybe sometimes she burns the food. What happened? The relationship mash up. Or if your husband cannot provide for you, or he sometimes does something that displeases you, is it his performance why you want the person, or is it the person himself? Anybody that I know only wants me for what they can get out of me. I don't want them. I'm telling you the truth. And anybody with integrity, that's how they operate. It's a prostitute who will operate for benefit. And the Bible is not very charitable towards prostitution. The point I'm making is that if we end up in a life where... We are oriented towards behavior in how we relate towards God. Behavior instead of the person. Somebody is being a prostitute in the picture. Somebody is a prostitute or a servant. You are in it because of what you can get or because of what the person can get out of you. It's not about relationship. I'm trying to help you to see how it is when your relationship with God is based on the wrong thing. It's not properly oriented. It becomes a strain on both of you. When I know that you appreciate me because of my performance. Look here, every day of my life I have to perform. Every day. I can't relax any day that I don't perform properly. I'm in trouble. There's pressure on me. Has God done that to us? Jesus says, 
I don't call you servants. I have called you friends. He goes further and says that he has put his spirit in our hearts that we might cry, Abba, Father. A child is accepted. Yes, your parents bother you and want you to behave properly, right? They want you to, to, to do the work, right? You think it's in order that you might be their child? No, they're trying to make life better for you that you grow up with the right attitudes. But you belong. That's why when you do carry on your foolishness, they're not turning you out. Well, I know some parents turn out children. <laughs> right? But I, I can't sympathize with that because God never turned out any of us. I agree that there are times when children become professional thieves. Murderers, drug users, sometimes it becomes so extreme that you can't let them stay in the house anymore, right? When I say, when I say children, I mean when they get, get up in age, right? Yeah. But I'm talking about children like, say, up to the age of 10. If the child really gets that bad, something wrong with, with you as a parent. Yeah. What I'm saying really is that your claim to belong is not because of your performance it's because you belong it's because of your blood relationship to the person and God has created a blood relationship between us and him by giving us his blood his flesh and blood son to be a part of us forever that is our claim to belong it's not because we obey rules but if we focus on the ways of Christ I want to walk like Christ I want to do the works of Christ I want to know the ways of Christ. If we focus on the peripherals and not the person, what happens is that we are bound to be focused on how, how we perform instead of the person of Christ. Paul explains the true relationship. Here's what he said. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what's the difference between this and what I just looked at? Because I said it's not the ways of Christ. It's not doing the deeds of Christ. It's not walking as Christ walked. How does this make it any different? Different. Paul said, it is not I who live, but what? Christ, Christ liveth in me. Who is doing the ways of Christ? Christ. Christ. Who is living the life of Christ? It is Christ. It is not I. The point I'm making, brothers and sisters, is that Christianity is not about being like Jesus. It's about allowing Jesus to live. You can't live the life of Christ. That's why you fail so many times. You can't live it. You, the, the thing you're trying to do is an impossibility. Only Jesus Christ can live the life of Jesus Christ. The aim is not to be like him. The aim is to let him live. That's the focus of life. Amen. That's the thing that we are not getting right. Following the illusion. And not getting the substance. That has been the problem. What we do is not important. It is who does it. It is who lives. Jesus' burden. And focus. We, I, I touched on this a few times. I'm going back to it because like Brother Peter reminded us this morning. You can't stop preaching some things until they are understood and received. I don't mean to bore you by repetition. But each time I hope you get something different. What name do you give somebody who kind of polish up the truth a little bit? Exaggerate a bit. You call him a liar. Me too. Right. If you catch a fish two feet long and you say catch a, foot, a fish two and a half feet long, you're a liar. 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 Alright, somebody will say, well, I just exaggerate it a little. You're a liar. True. Truth is exactly how the thing goes. If you, if you add to it or you embellish it or you polish it up a bit, you're a liar. Because your intent is to mislead people. Isn't that right? Good, I ask you to make sure that you, you, you give me the right answer. Because I'm going to read something. John 14 and verse 18. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now I'm going to tell you why he said it, right? He was about to leave the world. His disciples were bothered. You know why they were troubled? 
Because some of them had left their job. Peter and John and James were fishermen. They left the fishing. Matthew was a tax collector. He left the, the tax collection. They left the business. And for three and a half years, they followed this man around. And they waited for him to set up the kingdom of God. And after three and a half years, he comes and he says, I'm going to leave the world and go back to God. What? You're going to just leave us so? You make us leave everything and follow you and now you are going to leave us? What are we going to do? And he says, look here. Don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me. Then here he says, I am not going to leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So, okay. Here am I. I am Peter or I am James or I am John. I am sitting there and this man says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm coming to you. What am I to expect? Because if he doesn't keep his word, he's a what? He's a liar. Okay. What? Or he will send his brethren. Or he will send his brethren, right. Because he says I. So if he even sends his brethren, then it's not the truth, right? Okay. He doesn't only say this. When you get the time, read John 14, 15, 16, 17. Read those four chapters and look at what Jesus is saying there. I've been going through them with a fine tooth comb. And I've been so blessed. Because I see the promise, he's desperate to get them to be comfortable. He's saying, look here, don't worry. I'm going to send this comforter to be with you forever. Look, and he explains how it's going to happen. And they're there watching him with rapt attention because they don't want to miss a word because they want to know how are they going to be comforted. He says, I will come to you. And he says... He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Same chapter. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. When last has Jesus manifested himself to you? Now I don't mean that you needed some money and a friend brought some money and gave you. Because that happened to, 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 to criminals and atheists too, right? I don't mean that the place was dry and you pray for rain and rain fall. Yeah, I believe God answers prayers, but I mean something where you can say, Jesus came to me this morning in a way that I cannot mistake. Now, when Jesus says, I will manifest myself to him, I'm thinking of the person who does not tell lies. He says, I'm going to appear in your life. Look here. I'm not going to leave it to chance that you just suspect that I'm there. I'm going to manifest. The word manifest means what? Reveal, show, make known clearly, right? I'm going to manifest myself to you. You're going to see me operating in your life in a very clear way. Doesn't your heart stir a bit when you hear that? Yeah. The problem with Christianity is when you're, you're trying to live like a Christian and day and night you're trying to, to do the right things and you don't see no evidence that God is with you. That's hard, isn't it? Yeah. When you and the man next door who is not a Christian, you're living, you're having the same experience. What's the point? You just have to be struggling, struggling and hope one day heaven will come. But there's nothing right now. That's not what Jesus promised. That's not what Jesus promised. If he did not tell the truth here, you have to say he's a liar. I'm not going to say this. I'm going to say there's some part of this formula that we have missed. And I'm going to talk about it in just a moment. Let's look at another promise. John 14 and verse 12. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Brother Bill. Paul is preaching and this guy dropped out of the window. Stone dead. Come upstairs. Everybody start to mourn. Paul just goes down, takes him by the hand, back to life. Eutychus was his name, right? Paul is there gathering wood. And a viper, a deadly viper, connects with his hand. Let me tell you, snake bite any of you. Hospital as fast as possible. The church march up for today. Right? It's our pattern of life. It's our habit. It's how we live. It's our world. It's our 21st century. It's our, our level of Christianity. That's how it is. People who experience the reality of these promises, they didn't live like that. Death and danger and sickness. It was nothing to them. How can Jesus be alive and, and a snake bother him? How can a snake be a problem to Christ? How can a dead man be a problem to Christ? How can a sickness be a problem to Christ? The problem is that the experience of Jesus 
living within is not a reality. I'm telling you, that is a problem. We use the form and we use the words, but in actual fact, the relationship is with the illusion. It's not with the substance. That is the problem. Jesus said he was going back to his father, and so we would do greater works than he ever did. When last have you seen one of those greater works? I mean, sometimes you see these people on TV say they're healing people, right? Not down people on the ground. Sometimes you see a little crippled man, he gets up and he's shuffling, right? They say they heal the man. I take the words of Christ and I think, I think healing, total and complete, like the work of God is supposed to be. This is what he promised. <laughs> John 14, 13 to 14. Jesus says, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. What does whatsoever mean? Amen. Really? Amen. Everything. That will I do. Promise of somebody who is not a liar. I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He says it again. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I can't stand to be a Christian and not, not experience this. I can't stand it. It doesn't make sense. These are the words of somebody who cannot lie. If this is not true, time we stop fooling ourselves about Christianity. But you know, I know it's true. Something about the way the Bible is written, something about the words of Christ just ring with truth. It's impossible that it should be a lie. So the challenge is, oh God, where is the balance? Where is the connecting link? Why is it that you don't, you have not, you don't see in 2,000 years, you have to go back to the Bible to see the fulfillment of these promises? You know what I say to God? I say, I don't care if 2,000 years any Christian has not found this. I'm not saying nobody has. I'm just saying you don't really hear about them much, right? But look here. What does that matter to you and me? What does it matter? You only want to know there's a door there and God says it's open, right? If nobody steps through that door, what is to stop me from stepping through that door? Yeah, I like when I think like this. Because I'm not following anybody. I'm, I'm, I, the word of God is what is gripping my mind. And I want what I see there. I don't care about anybody else. I mean, I love and care for them. But I mean, your experience is not going to define what my experience is. If there is a God and there is a Jesus Christ and these promises are true, I'm going to have them. Can't you say that? So I'm going to look at the vital steps because there are some steps and I believe that looking at the Bible, you can see these steps. We talk about faith. This morning we were talking about faith. Fine. Wonderful. True. I accept that. I believe faith is everything. But I think sometimes faith is misunderstood a little bit. Some elements of faith and the way it works, I think sometimes I myself and all of us sometimes don't get it quite right. I'm going to go back to what he says in John 14. You know, I've been feeding on this passage, right? That's why I'm living on it and talking so much about it. John 14, 23. Judah said to him in the verse before, Lord, how are you going to show yourself to us and not to the world? Now, Jesus says he's coming back, right? But he says the world won't see him, but you will see him, right? So here am I sitting there and I'm hearing him and I'm saying, that's strange because I'm thinking like a human, right? We're going to see him and the other people can't see him. You know, in Jamaica, they say that if you put, if you put, put donkey water and you, you can't see dopey. You ever hear that? They say if the, the water that, that donkey drink out of. They say if you take that water and put it in your eye, you can see dopey. <laughs> I mean, those are old wives' tale, right? You have some things like that that old-time people say. But the point I'm making is, it kind of helped me to illustrate what I'm saying. There is the idea. This is the kind of idea that the disciples are getting because Jesus says, you will see me, but the world won't see me. They want to know if he's going to give, put some kind of spell over them. Or he's going to give them some special kind of glasses or something, Right? So they say, how are we going to see you and the world won't see you? Because they are thinking in physical terms. Here's the answer. Jesus answered and said unto him, 
If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our home with him. That's the explanation. How are we going to see you, Lord? I'm going to come live with you. Really? But how do we know? He says, I will manifest myself to you. Somehow in this relationship, he's going to be in your home and you're going to see the evidence of it everywhere. You're going to see him and feel him and experience him all around you. If, 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 look at that little word. This is the way. It begins with you. It does not begin with Jesus Christ. It begins with you. That's the point I want to make because Christ has done what is necessary. But what about you? If a man loves me, I'm going to assume that all of us fulfill that. I'm not, I, I know it's, I'm probably wrong, but I'm going to assume that we all understand that. If a man loves me, the Bible says we love him. What? I say if you don't love Jesus, go back and read the Bible until you learn to love him. Go back and think about what he has done until you learn to love him. Because if you don't pass that hurdle, nothing else can happen. I know I love him because I don't see the point of life without him. I know I love him because I know how he changed my life, right? Because I know what I was. I know what I was. I know where I was heading. If I didn't meet Jesus, I would have killed myself long ago. Long ago. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not like these people who just hold on to life for nothing. I think of people who are atheists and I think they're so stupid. You see, if I was an atheist, a real atheist, I would live for nothing but pleasure. Why else? If, if taking your money would make me happy, I would take it. Who says I'm wrong? Evolution? If I want what you have and I take it, who tell me I'm wrong? Nobody can tell me that I'm wrong if there's no God. Because if there's no God, there's no right and there's no wrong. There's nothing but to live for pleasure. And when I get fed up of life, totally fed up, I just take my own life. Why not? I'm going to die anyway and go into nothingness forever. What's the point of living? But Jesus took me from that kind of thinking and he gave me a purpose and a reason. And he made my life respectable and I tell you, I love him because of it. So he says, if a man love me, he will what? Now, I was confused because somebody told me that this meant keep the commandments. So I, I set out to keep 10 statements. And if you set out to keep 10 statements, what you are doing is you are dealing with the ways of Christ. Instead of what? Instead of Christ. It's like, again I go back to marriage, or a relationship, because it's very nice to use as an illustration, right? You get married, and you know what you get? 10 instructions. You never see your wife. You never hear her voice actually. You never touch her hand. All you get is a set of instructions as to how you are to behave. And she says, one day, maybe about when you're about 90, I'm going to come and visit you. I'm going to tell you. You're going to be looking for a different relationship. And honestly, that's what's going to happen. Are you going to try to cheat in the meantime? Because you've got to have something to hold you right now, okay? You can't wait until another 50 years. It kind of seems like people are saying, this is what we got from Christ. So, keep my words. All you do right now is just obey the instructions. But I realize it's not so. That's not what Jesus is saying. Not at all. What does it mean to keep? What do you think keep means? Listen to, believe, live. Yes, all of that. How do you keep a person's words if you are not hearing the person's words? It's not talking about some preset instructions. Jesus is saying, I am here constantly living with you and instructing you. If you are responding to me, if you are responding to me, not to a set of something written on, on a book or on, a, or on stone. He's talking about a living relationship. If you love me and you're in a relationship where you are responding to me. You are responding to my words. The consequence is, my father will love you. Does God love everyone? Yes. So how would you say, my father will love him? What does that mean? Yes. 
My father will demonstrate his love. Whenever your relationship with a person depends upon how the person can demonstrate his love towards you. If you hold a person at a distance, he might want to do things for you that he can't do. Because you have attached yourself to this person and you're responding to the person, he can do things in your life that he cannot do in the next person's life. So Jesus is saying, if a man love me, he will respond to what I'm saying and my father will be able to show how much he loves that person. The other day, Matthew mash up Haiti. He didn't touch Jamaica, right? I saw everybody on Facebook, Christian saying, praise God for what he did. I saw some atheists and some other people come on and say, stupidness. So what? Nobody was praying for Haiti? I said I don't know about Haiti, but I know who was praying for Jamaica. I can't talk for the other man, right? If God does not hear prayers, let's give up praying. But not everybody gets the same response from God. You know, twelve you can pray, pray the same prayer. And one gets an answer and one doesn't. Because one person has a different kind of relationship with God. God is loving that person. Not that he loves the other one any less. But he's able to demonstrate his love to this person. Many years ago a friend of mine. Told me a story. His name is Lambert. He said that when he was a little boy. About four or five. He and his friend from next door. Another little boy his age. They were playing in some dirty water. And the both of them got very sick. I think they picked up some kind of dysentery or something. Very sick. He said he started to vomit. His, pain, his, his belly was in terrible pain. It's like... He said he felt like his, his belly was going to rip out. Five-year-old or four-year-old little boy. He said it was so bad. He said, Mommy, you can't make my belly stop paining me. His mother was a young Christian. In fact, she was a Seventh-day Adventist, just baptized. But she believed in keeping the Sabbath and so on, right? So, he said the next morning, the family next door, they got the little boy and they took him to the hospital. He said his mother refused to take him to the hospital. His mother said, he said his mother took his hand and lifted him up and said, God, you see my son that is suffering. I can't carry him to hospital today because Lord is the Sabbath. Now, I'm not saying whether she was right or wrong. That's not the point. The point is, this was the woman's faith, right? This is what she believed. She held up and said, I can't carry him because I'm not breaking your Sabbath, Lord. You see my little boy. He said within a little more than an hour, all the pain left. And he was perfectly healthy. By midday, he was outside running up and down. He said that evening, they heard bawling from next door. The little boy that they carried to the hospital was dead. Now it's his experience he told me personally. I'm not saying how to interpret that. I'm just telling you the story. But the point I'm making is we can tell from the Bible that when somebody puts their trust in God against all the odds, God don't fail them. Now I think this is what God meant when he says, when Jesus meant when he says, my father will love him. There are some people who are going to see God in their home and in their lives. There are some people who are going to have the experience. And Jesus says, it is those who keep my word. Those who allow me to get into their lives. And he says, I'm going to come and camp with that person. I'm going to come at my yard at your yard. I'm going to live there. I'll never be out of the place. So let thief come, gunman come, disease come, hurricane come. I'm going to live with you. That is a promise of somebody who does not lie. I believe the key is in these words. If a man love me, he will keep my words. God's part of it you can forget about but because God don't lie. He will love you and make his home with you. That part is a given. This is the part that is failing. This is a part that is failing. It's not working because of this. Now I say that this is another way of expressing the word surrender. To keep the words of Christ is another way of saying surrender to Christ. And I'm just going to spend a few moments speaking about this. I know it's communion, but I want to just make this point before I stop. Jesus tells us what to do. 
Luke 14, this is a verse that was in the Sabbath school lesson that we didn't really read. I think Sister Law read it. But I want to read it again. Luke 14, 26 to 27. If any man come to me, you remember Jesus says, anything you ask, he will do it. Now he says, any man, meaning who? Everybody. If any man, whoever you be, come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also. He, what? I think, I think that must be the problem. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What is it to hate mother, father, wife, children, brethren, sisters? What is it? It is simply this. These are the things that make up my life. My father, my mother, my wife, my children, my brethren, my sisters. These are the things that make up my life. That's what my, my life revolves around. They are my identity. They are the things I live for. My house is my land, my car, my whatever. These are the things I live for. Jesus says, if you don't hate them, when you hate something, what do you do? You step away from them. In other words, I don't think he's saying you have to literally give them up. He's saying that you must divorce yourself from your attachment to them and they must become no longer your concern. What? If I'm not concerned about my mortgage and what I'm to wear and what I'm to eat and all these things, how am I expected to survive? You see, it matters if you live. It matters if you are alive. But if somebody else is living, it's not your concern anymore. It becomes that person's business. That is the point. Is it possible that somebody comes to live inside of you in such a complete way? That he begins to take care of all these issues and you don't have to worry about them? You know, George Muller says, where anxiety begins, faith ends. Where faith begins... Anxiety ends because I'm telling you, if Jesus Christ lives in me and he has made his home with me and he promises to manifest himself with me. Look here. I could know that the landlord is coming tomorrow to turn me out. I couldn't care less. What am I caring about? I'm caring if it is my responsibility. But when I've given my life to somebody else and it is his responsibility, how can that bother me? But remember, remember the condition. If a man loves me and does what? Keep my word. If you are not keeping the word of Christ, you better fret. Because when you are not keeping his word, you know instinctively that you don't belong to him. That is why self-will is the greatest danger to Christianity. Self-will is the greatest danger to the life in Christ. When you are doing your own thing, you better take care of your own debts, your own problems, your own sickness. You better take care of it. When sickness takes you, hospital as fast as you can. Because when you are living your own life, you are responsible for these things. But when you have given it to Christ, relax and let the storms blow. It doesn't matter. It's not your life anymore. That is the point. It's a beautiful way to live. Does it look impractical? Look here. When I became a Christian, that's what happened to me. That's why I know it is true. I came to the place where I was ready to die. I came to the place where... I had, I had so many problems on my 22-year-old head. I didn't want to live. I was thinking seriously of killing myself. As somebody grew up in a Christian home, I was thinking of killing myself. And I realized that nobody can be a Christian until you come to the place where you are ready to die. I was ready to die. I didn't know what I was living for. Living for. I wasn't going nowhere. My life wasn't nothing. And the thought came. You never give God a chance. The thought came, I wonder if God can take this and make something out of it. It was, it was, it was, you see in my condition, it was so beautiful to think that somebody else could take over because I was messing up. Everywhere I turned, I mess up. Everywhere I turned, I mess up. Everything I was doing was just a mess. And the thought came, somebody else can do it because I knew I couldn't do it because I tried for 22 years and I was just failing. And the thought came, somebody else can do it. That's what made me become a Christian. And what I found was so beautiful, so satisfying. I have never, ever felt like I could turn back from it. Even when sometimes I drew back from that surrender. But still, I couldn't turn my back on it. 
because I tasted and I knew what it was. And that is what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, if you want to become my disciple, if you want these promises to be fulfilled for you, you need to give yourself to me. Because I know what I'm doing and you don't. And I will take care of it. But I've got to have you and I've got to have all of you. I want to live to make you happy. I want to give you the peace that passes understanding. I want to give you the joy that is un un unshadowed. But I can't give you while you are living. That peace is in me and only in me. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. You have to give it away, brothers and sisters. Jesus keeps his promise. But have you opened the door? That's the point. Surrender. Death to self. This is the key that opens the door. I'm telling you, we have said it many times, but have we taken the step? Paul says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now when you love Christ, when you truly love him, Faith leads you to the next step. And that is the step of surrender. You remember the story of this lady? She took all her money. She was a poor lady. They said she bought that an ointment for, that cost how much? 300 pence. Right? 300 pence. I understand that in those days it was like about a year's wages. One year. For an average salary in Jamaica, that's nearly a million dollars, Right? Maybe more. You buy a, 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 a rare and, and, and expensive perfume and you break it and pour in his food. What a waste! Man, the, 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 the covetous Judah says, you know, this could have been sold for how much money and given to the poor. Jesus says, you want to do the works of God. You want to help the poor. Listen, you have the poor always with you. She has done this for me because she loves me. Love always leads to works. Love and faith lead to surrender. When you love somebody, you give yourself to them. Isn't that what you ladies do? When you truly love somebody and that love is combined with trust and the person says, will you marry me? You don't have to think twice. It's when you don't love or you don't trust that you think twice. Rightly so. Because ginals are out there. But when you love and you trust, you say, I do, easy. And you trust the person to care for you, especially in the old days. These days, not so much because women have their career. But in the old days, when a woman said, I do, you're going to go live with the man. He must work and mind you for the rest of your life. You take care of the woman, he goes and work. And there were better days too, right? The whole of people say yes. <laughs> Faith and love. Produce surrender. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you love me and you trust me, give yourself to me. That's what he's saying. Give yourself to me. Drop the guard. Get rid of this self-defense and give yourself and allow me. Conversely, when you surrender to Jesus, it works backwards. Because the faith that made you surrender and now you surrender, surrender strengthens your faith. The Bible says so. Abraham is used as an example. James 2 and verse 22 says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? God said to Abraham, kill your son. Why did Abraham go to kill his son? He loved God, and he trusted God. Trust you to the point a man said, instead go kill your son, and you're gone? Wow. That is trust indeed. But you see, if God had said to Abraham, go and kill yourself, Easy. No problem. God chose the thing that he loved more than anything in life. His one son, the son of his old age. He was born and Abraham was a hundred years old. The one, well he had Ishmael but he wasn't a real son. He was a half. This was the son of promise and God says go kill him. And Abraham goes to kill him because he trusts God. He says anything you tell me I will do. That's where God wants us. Romans 10 and verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing. And I misunderstood. Because I thought it meant faith comes by listening. But no, faith comes by heeding the word of God. You want to believe something? If, so, if, 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 if God tells you to do something, do it and see if your faith doesn't grow stronger. 
The next time you have an impulse to get up and read the Bible, read it and see if your faith doesn't grow stronger. The next time you have a, a desire to go and give Sister Mary to a visit or a Bible study, go and do it and see if your faith doesn't grow stronger. The next time you feel impressed to help your wife wash the dishes or your husband to do something, go and do it and see if your relationship with Christ does not grow tighter. Because the thing about it, you see, relationships don't grow by theoretical ideas. You get what I'm saying? If I just meditate, meditate, meditate on Jesus and read about him, will I grow stronger as a Christian? Relationships don't work like that. That is why they say long distance relationships often fall apart. Because you are writing letters to the person back and forth. You might even be on email in these modern times or Skype. But I'm going to tell you, if the person is far away, make sure it doesn't stay too long. Because little by little, the trust and the togetherness and the confidence in the relationship begins to fall down, begins to break down. Because interaction is vital to a relationship. You see the person's face, you talk to the person, you hear the person's answer. You see how the person deals with you and responds to your desires and your requests. You are being bound closer and closer to, to the person. Two are becoming one. In that situation, the words, the writing, the meditation means something. But without that interaction, you're not, it's not enough. You're not getting to know the person really. So faith comes because Jesus and I are doing things together. The next time you feel impressed to go to Mandeville and give out some tracks, go do it! And see how it binds you a little closer to Jesus. Whatever he says to you, do it and see how the relationship grows. That's what we're talking about when we talk about surrender. I'm not talking about big things like get up and leave your job. Because your job probably is where God wants you to be. I'm talking about the little thing. You sit down around your computer and the Lord says, this time you should be doing that. You respond. Don't let your habits bind you to a way of life. Listen to him and respond to what he says. And see how he comes into your home and into your life. And begins to fill everything around you. And you begin to see his presence manifested more and more. Because what he's really looking for is the opportunity to live your life for you. And he's not going to come and take you over like a demon. He's coming through your will and through your mind. He's speaking to you. He's giving you impressions. And as you are responding both lives are becoming one life. That's how it works. That's the real experience of surrender to Christ. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3.20 If any man hear my voice and what? And what is that door? What's the name of that door? It's your heart, but how do you open it? Surrender! Surrender! That comes from faith. That is the key. Surrender. If you don't surrender, the door remains closed, locked. And you know what people say? Okay. I'll obey the ten. I'll even obey all the instructions in the Bible. Okay. But I need to be in charge. That is not Christianity. That is the illusion. Following the word instead of letting the person take over. That is the illusion. If you understand what I'm saying today, that is my point. Don't believe that you're a Christian by following the words of Christ. It's Jesus who must live. That is what Christianity is. It's swapping your life for another person's life. That is Christianity. And if you can't do that, as Cindy says, the words can help you to find that place. But understand that you're still on the journey. You're not there yet. When you are there is when you have chosen that he shall live and not I. You see, when you have this, you think it matters? You think it matters what kind of car you drive? You think it matters what, what, what kind of dress you're wearing? You think it matters about how you look? You think those things matter to you? You gave yourself away. That's why Christians could go to the, 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 the burning. They could burn them alive, tie them up and roast them alive. And they are singing. You can't kill somebody who is dead, can you? They gave their lives away. It didn't matter anymore. Anything can happen. They know that they are in Christ and they are certain. They have found their place in life. Jesus is in control. He is doing everything for the best. What does it matter 
if you go to sleep now or 20 years in the future. It doesn't matter. You are in him. You are in a place where you, you belong. Nothing else matters. So he says he, he stands at the door and knocks on the work of surrendering to Christ, keeping his word. If this is the door which allows God into our lives. Quickly, I'll run through factors in surrender. Single-mindedness is one. Jesus says the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. What he's saying is, the eye is what lets in light into your body. Like a window lets in light into a room. Now if the room has one window and it's turned towards the light, then the whole room is full of light, right? But if you turn that window towards darkness, what happens? The whole room is full of darkness. So the light of the body is Jesus Christ. If your eye is turned to Jesus, then your whole body is full of light. But if you turn your eye somewhere else and try to live the life of Jesus, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. You're going to be torn this way while you're trying to live this way. Your eye is not single. It's turned toward the source of darkness and yet you are trying to live the life of light. Impossible. You need to turn the window to the right direction and there's only one source of light and it's Jesus Christ. So singleness of mind. Because no man can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God. I'm going to say on self. You cannot serve God and self. Exactly. You know, to serve self and try to serve God. I am going to serve self and I'm going to give God the crumbs. Because so it works. There's always a number one, el numero uno. And when it's me, God will get the crumbs. I give him the crumbs. Why? Because I want to be saved. Because I want to look good. Because I want to say I'm a Christian. But it's not real Christianity. It's a deception. Factors in surrender. Another one. Make up your mind. For which of you intending to build a tower. Sit it not down first and count at the cost. Whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation. And is not able to finish it. All that behold it begin to mock him saying. This man began to build and was not able to finish. Rachel says she wants to be baptized. Praise the Lord. Alana says she wants to be baptized. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy. God is so good. And I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that because it means that our young people are understanding and being touched by the gospel. What I want to say to them, you see young people, I could name on my two hands the young people that I baptized from this group who are no longer here. I could name them out on my hands. I won't call the names. But you know what happened to those young people? They got into baptism and they never counted the cost. They never counted the cost. They never considered what it means to serve Christ. And so you know what? They started to build. But they never had sufficient to finish the building. And so, all that behold, it began to mock them. Because they began to build, but they were not able to finish. I hope this morning, I've made it clear to you young people, what it means. It's not a change of your behavior. It's a change of your identity. It's you putting yourself out of the way and allowing Christ to take control. That's what Christianity means. That means there's no turning back for you. That means there's no compromise with the world. Other worldly young people can be of any way they want. You know why? It's them living. But when you have given yourself away, it's Jesus Christ who will live. And it doesn't matter. The vanities and follies of, of this life, you have put them away. You have counted the cost. You have chosen Jesus Christ. And that's what you will live if you have made this decision and you have counted the cost, you won't turn back. I guarantee it. The last factor I will emphasize is paying the price. Matthew 13, 44 to 46, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, 
who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What did he do to get the pearl? That all represents you. Your mother, father, sister, brother, houses, lands, everything, your own life also, you give it all away because you want the pearl. And the pearl is who? Jesus Christ. You want him. Why would we not want Jesus? Why would we not? One, we don't believe. Two, we're extremely stupid. One or the other. Because if somebody is coming into your life to take it over and make everything perfect, get rid of your stress and your problem and your challenges, why would you turn your back on it? But I understand sometimes you don't believe. But I also understand some people are very stupid. God help us that every one of us might understand the value of this pearl of great price, might understand exactly what it is, and may pay the price. No matter how great the price, the pearl is worth far more. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have understood what we have been saying today. I hope you have been blessed.